Okay, good morning, colleagues. I think we can start now. We, we have enough people um, who have joined the, the webinar. Uh, welcome to our third event of the week for 2021 International uh, Open Access Week that we host as, as UWC. Uh, in terms of the webinar today, we are joined by Mr. Arno Adrianse, who is our Deputy Director for Resources and LICT. Uh, he will be doing the first presentation for the first 10 minutes or so. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Dr. Ephraim Mklama, who has joined us from Swahili. He will speak briefly about, about his organization. Uh, Ephraim, Dr. Mklama, welcome to UWC and thank you for agreeing to be part of this webinar. Thank then, you very much. Then Ms. Alison Fulat will be our moderator. You know, we will be taking questions from the floor, as well as probing some of the statements and the presentations that will be made by the, by the presenters. And at the end of the webinar, uh, Dr. Shalin Diakut will say a word of thanks, especially to our guests and those people who have uh, attended the webinar. Without further ado, uh, Mr. Adrianse, you can start with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Let me share my screen. Um, Right, can you see my screen? Yes, I know, we can see your screen. Thank you. Right. Good, mo good morning, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, Alfred. Um, as part of International Open Access Week, my short presentation is on open, my short presentation on open educational resources in higher education will focus on the need for OERs and OA from a library perspective. So from um, from a UWC library perspective, I want to share our library vision and mission just to create a context. So um, both of these statements speak about the need for innovative and relevant library services and relevant library resources. So they um, contribute directly to the formulation of our objectives. And one of, in, in this context, one of the key objectives is to develop, manage, and safeguard relevant and accessible collections. Of course, this is an objective um, among many that we have in, in the library. And all of these objectives are aimed to, to strengthen the role and value of the library, to create uh, sustainably vibrant digital library services, to provide equity of access, um, that's an important uh, statement, and to optimize and leverage technologies um, to improve our services. And um, so how do, we, how do we do this and in what environment do we do this? The one specific environment, obviously, that we, that we operate in is um, an economic environment. And I want to just pause here because it speaks directly to the need for, for open access and the need for open educational resources. We are still in the midst of a, a global pandemic and, and globally can, the economies have been impacted on massively by this pandemic. And if you bring that closer to home, the South African economy, even prior to the pandemic has been uh, under severe strain with low or negative uh, growth in the economy, high unemployment, um, everything, the, the cost of everything from electricity to, um, um, to petrol is uh, sky high. And all of this impacts on funding to educational institutions, uh, impacts on the budgets that a department such as a library would be working with. 
So these budget constraints impact directly on purchasing power. And library budgets in this environment that I've just briefly sketched up um, have remained fairly static. If you look at uh, the library's budget over the past five years, the accumulative growth in the budget has been less than 1%. So what that looks like on paper, if you look at the budget five years ago, and if you look like at the budget today, they look almost identical. It's 0.59% um, is the accumulated growth in the budget. And this, of course, has led to uh, numerous cancellations over several years. And it is compounded by the exorbitant cost of information resources. If you look at the accumulative um, increase in the cost of information resources over that same period, you are looking at in excess of 15 to 20% increase in the cost of resources over that same period. And if you factor in uh, the value of the RAND against some of our major trading currencies, we at its worst, the RAND against the pound was 22 RAND. Um, so if you are purchasing anything, you're purchasing something at a cost 10,000 pounds, you're suddenly looking at 220,000 RAND. And in that environment, to develop the scope and depth of collection to adequately support study, all areas of study at a, at a major university is a major challenge. So let's make the case for OERs. Uh, let's first look at um, what we're talking about. Open access and open educational resources are often used inter interchangeably. And we obviously, we know there are differences. And I don't think it's, uh, it's from a lack of understanding that people often use them interchangeably. It's the context in which that happens. It's when people speak about um, both of these making resources freely available. Open access initiatives aim to remove barriers uh, and it, it doesn't necessarily address copyright issues, but it, it speaks about the methods of funding and access to, to research. Whereas open educational resources, the, the copyright holder would make this um, available by adding um, a Creative Commons license or, or others. And the ideal there is then to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute without the need to ask permission of the copyright holder. But of course, you would cite that, that uh, the owner of that work um, when you are using the research. So researchers um, will often tell you, um, academics will often tell you, um, they prefer the currency of information offered in journals. So this is understandable. Uh, this is uh, cutting edge research. It is, it is available now, uh, immediately, or is it? It's, uh, it's often not. And also in the same breath, uh, I want to add that uh, a high number of academics um, at, 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 um, at certainly at our institution are still prescribing specific titles for courses um, or even recommending reading um, for uh, specific titles. And both of these scenarios present challenges. Journals are caught in big deals. And uh, now the big deal uh, 10, 15 years ago, maybe longer, it was a, a boon to, to, to libraries. It was seen as a as a, um, a, a major benefit, suddenly you had access to thousands of journals for, um, for one price. That price, as I've just illustrated, has, has increased um, um, dramatically and it has become unaffordable. And large numbers of, of, of journals of research is tracked behind paywalls and subject to frequent cancellations. And the, the books that academics are prescribing um, of course, we want this to be accessible remotely. So we're looking increasingly at purchasing electronic form, um, um, uh, copies of these, of these prescribed and recommended titles. And I can tell you that mostly these are not available. They, they're published electronically, but they're not available to, to a library to purchase. They're available as a one-on-one -on -one purchase. So you, as a student, you can purchase a book and, and you get an, uh, an access code and you, you can access it. It's not available, prescribed, recommended, 
electronic titles are not um, available um, as standalone ebooks, all available in a, in a model that is uh, accessible to libraries. So, how do we how do we deal with this? How do we? Um, I wanted to add, um, you know, we have a, a beautiful library on a beautiful campus, and we have um, a vast collection of, of print um, titles, uh, close on 300,000, I think, at the last count. This is a it's, a, it's a valuable print collection, and it has largely been inaccessible um, throughout 2019 and 2020. And um, the the, the need for electronic titles, um, as I've just explained, especially when they are prescribed or recommended, um, is, is there. It is, a, it is a no need. And it is not as if the library is not trying to purchase these. They're just not available. So therefore, we end up having to support um, initiatives that, that facilitate access. And open access, access initiatives have been coming along for quite a while now. I was watching a webinar when uh, somebody said um, uh, these uh, initiatives have uh, started just after 2000. I mean, that's 20, 20 years ago. Um, it might even be uh, prior to that. So they are, they have been in existence for a while and there's uh, some traction being made, not a lot uh, from some perspectives. And we support open access on both an international and a national level. And increasingly, open access is being um, pushed through transformative agreements in local negotiations. And these are, of course, a, a massive groundswell of support for open access in, initiatives worldwide. And um, scholarly communication, and in particular, scholarly journal publishing. Um, is, which is an integral part of the research process, needs um, open access it's because it's, it's hampered by um, the paywalls that journals are, are, are hidden behind. And so our support for open access, access initiatives um, have to, um, as I said, the, the, you know, there's been a lot of initiatives and uh, I think there's been a lot of um, um, trading in, in, in mud, really. Um, so let me move on before I, I digress. Uh, let me move to open educational resources and the need to identify and encourage the usage of them. It is, um, it is, there's often a case to be made for something that is available. And in a lot of cases, we've made the argument that the resources that the, the library already owns. So now I'm not talking an open educational resource, but I'm talking a resource that is already available. And instead of prescribing a title that is that is inaccessible because it's not available as a standalone ebook, um, the alternative is to identify titles that are available. Um, so the case for OER, uh, OERs continue. Um, so I started off by saying that access to, to relevant or relevant resources are the key. And I'm finishing by saying that access to these relevant resources are key to student success. And OERs have the ability to ensure equitative access. OERs um, can ensure that each student has access to the same text to the same textbook even. Um, there are, um, it can level the field, the, the playing field between under-resourced and highly resourced. And uh, people will point out that, that there are problems with OERs and certainly there are. And I don't even want to, um, to focus on any of these problems because none of them are insurmountable. I think the, the, the point to end in the, uh, on is that a far bigger positive is to have texts that are available for students that um, levels that that field of that playing field where everybody has access to to the same resources that they need and therefore have the same chance of 
um, success. And um, as I said, brief um, um, presentation, and I hope that has uh, given some insight into, into the need for, for OERs and OA from a, from a library perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anwar. Colleagues, if you have any question, we'll, we'll hold the questions until after uh, Dr. Mshanga's presentation. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Mshanga, you can start presenting. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, colleagues. Let me also try to share my slides. I probably will share my screen so that we can see. Okay. I hope you can see my slides. Yes, we can. Very clearly. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> there will be a video. Let me unshare once and reshare once again. I think I need to optimize the video sound before I share. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, um, everyone. You can see my slides? Yes, you can see your slides. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to discuss with you issues relating to open access and open educational resources. I think like what uh, Adrens said, it's a very key area, not only in higher education, but in education generally. Our experience at Saide is that if African universities in particular are to enhance the quality of educational provision, by improving student, student engagement. They need to embrace open education resources. And this is precisely because of the challenge that Mr. Adrian's mentioned, that prescribed textbooks are just beyond the reach of most institutions and most students. And a whole lot of students are doing without any, any, any resources in their respective programs. So we believe that um, if people embrace OER and embrace them in a very intelligent and creative way, we can be able to enhance the quality of educational provision. So indeed, yes, it is a privilege that I have this opportunity to um, share with you on open education resources and open access. Um, I was asked to uh, talk specifically about open education resources, OER. <laughs> and so my presentation will be fairly short. I hope I will try to keep within the 30 minutes. And I will say a bit about OER Africa, which is um, one of Saeed's biggest initiative that focuses on open education resources and tries to support institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa in embracing open education resources. I'll also say what, what, what OER are and why we should um, embrace open education resources. We have done quite a bit of work since as far back as 2008, if I remember well, in the various countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've worked with various universities and, and have been trying to get them to adopt um, open education resources. And, and we, we have learned a lot from uh, that experience. And I would like to share with you a few enabling factors that we identified, but also some of the barriers that a number of the institutions in the region are facing. And I will end by giving you some examples of uh, some of the work that uh, OER Africa has done 
in sub-Saharan Africa. So that is that is the the um, big initiative, and we do have a website oerafrica.org. If you click there, you will be able to see a whole lot of um, activities that we do, as well as resources that we've generated. And all resources that are on that website are actually openly licensed. Sometimes my slides don't want to move. So yes, OER Africa is um, it's an initiative of SAIDE. It started way back, as far back as 2008. And, and like I said, we support higher education institutions across the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa in embracing open education resources. So we support in policy development at institutional level. We also support um, governments to develop open education resources, uh, resources policies. We support uh, institutions in developing OER. We also support them in uh, searching for OER and adapting, repurposing open educational resources to fit their own context. So we work uh, with a lot of institutions in this area. We do also place a lot of emphasis on the research aspect of uh, open educational resources. We are interested, for instance, in knowing who on the continent makes use of open educational resources and in what sort of programs and with such what with with what sort of results especially on the part of uh, students so we do a lot of uh, research as well relating to the use of open education resources we don't confine our research to the african continent we 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 go beyond africa so that we can understand what is happening elsewhere in terms of how people are using open education resources. So I wasn't so sure who exactly I was going to talk to. And so I, I am hoping that my talk will be relevant to the audience in the, in the webinar today. So one of the things that I, that I will do is to explain what OER is. I may actually be preaching to the converted already. I would like though to start by getting it from you. I would like you to, I'm going to paste this link in the chat space. I would like you to click on that link. It will take you to a Jamboard, which is a, a digital whiteboard. I'd like you to write down what your understanding of OER is. So I'll just go out of this um, presentation mode for, for now. All right. I'm pasting it in the chat space. I hope you can all see that. Click on that uh, link in the chat space and it will take you to download. The link is there. Link is there. Yeah. Please click on it. I'm also clicking on it. And I hope you can you, you continue to see my my screen. Do you see the jumbot and the question I put in there? Hello? Uh, yes, if I am, we can take a sticky note. Yes, so, so just, just indicate in the using a sticker note. By the way, the sticker note is the fourth symbol on the left uh, panel, this one. Stick on it, and then it will give you the option to write, and you can, you can save it up there. OK. Curricular projects assignments. That's what um, somebody understands by OER. Let's have some more, a few more. Okay. 
free learning and teaching materials in the public domain or which have been distributed by their creators under open licenses. That's great, okay. Anything else? There's a, there's a third one there. Education texts which are open for use by anyone. Okay, this one emphasizes texts. Okay, we are coming up now. Educational resources that can be accessed by multiple people at the same time from a free publicly available platform. These are course content, textbook, under CC by license. Okay. Okay. Um, I think all those are, are um, correct ideas. I want to confirm again whether you can see my slides. Do you see my slides? Yes, we do. Good. Okay, thank you uh, for the ideas that have been put in the Jamboard. You can revisit the Jamboard um, later and you can post more ideas there and we will be able to um, harvest them at the end. Yes, so to us at Saidi, like I said, these are very, very important resources, especially in so far as the enhancement of quality of learning is concerned. But we, 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 place, we place a lot of importance on how they, these resources are actually used for educational purposes. So if you have attended, um, one of our workshops on OER, you will be familiar with um, this example that we always use. And we use it mostly when we run workshops for academics who are responsible for developing courses, identifying resources, including OER and adapting them and integrating them in their courses for the benefit of their students. So. If you look at this, it's a photograph that was taken way back by one of my colleagues who was at Saide when he went to the Kruger National Park. It is a resource, right? It's just a resource, but it has potential to be used for educational purposes. Okay, there we go. Sometimes my slides just get stuck. But until you structure some kind of learning around that resource, it doesn't become an educational resource. It just remains an ordinary resource. It becomes an educational resource if you structure, say, some questions around it. You structure some activity that, that your learners will engage with around that activity. So in this instance, there are questions like, what is the name of the bird in the foreground of the picture? Can you name three other varieties of this kind of bird? Maybe it is something on, on biology or on environmental studies or even on ecosystems, right? Now, to enable other people, you see, before, before, before you have that license, you, you have not granted other people the opportunity to maximally use this resource in the way they like. But once you put that license, which is an open license, you then grant that kind of permission so that anybody who comes across this resource will not need to ask the original creator of this resource who happens to be Tony Mays permission to use the resource. They can proceed 
because of the nature of the license that is there to use the resource in any way they like. And the type of license we have here is a CC BY. We'll say a little more about these licenses um, during the course of my presentation. Right? So all they need to do is to simply attribute the original creator of this resource, 20 minutes. And so you will see that um, somebody Notice that the type of license in 20 May's resource. And they realized that, oh, it was a very useful resource for their purposes. But they didn't want, they didn't want that black bird in the background. All they were interested in was the big bird in the foreground. So they actually altered the resource. They repurposed it. They adapted it to suit their purposes. They removed the black bird and remained with just that one bird because of the license that was there. Okay. And then they, they put some kinds of questions to some answers, rather, to some of the questions. And then followed the answer, followed up the answer with some, some more questions, right? The yellow hornbill shown on the left is one of the four varieties of hornbills common across sub-Saharan Africa. The other varieties are the gray and red hornbills and the much larger ground hornbill. So your students are beginning, they are beginning to learn from that resource. As the name suggests, the large hornbill is the key characteristic of the species. What does this suggest about their typical diet? You see, you are getting your students to engage more and more and more with this resource in order to learn more about this kind of bird, right? Okay. And so the, the importance of um, the license under which a resource is published is key in education. And that is significance also to the kinds of resources that we produce in our universities. If we want other people to use those resources and use them in most creative ways, you should use the type of license that enables those people to, to adapt the resource, to repurpose the resource without necessarily asking for your permission. And they will come up with the other, other variants, adaptations of your resource. They may actually improve on your resource. And if we all embrace uh, OER, then they will put back the adaptation using an open license as well for other people to access and use freely and adapt and improve on. And if we were to have all our institutions doing that, we would then have a plethora of resources for academics and for our students in various disciplines. And that would make a difference in terms of the research that we do, in terms of uh, the, the engagement our students have. I'll just play, play this uh, short video clip for you. I hope you can hear the sound. I would like somebody, I will play and stop and you confirm you can hear the sound and then I will continue playing it. It's just about uh, two minutes long. Open educational resources. Can you hear the sound? Yes, the sound is clear. Thank you very much. OERs are any type of educational materials that are in the public domain or released with an open license. The nature of these open materials means that anybody can legally and freely copy or use, adapt and reshare these materials. There are many types of OERs that range from textbooks to curricula, syllabi, lecture notes, assignments, tests, projects, audio, video, and animation. Why are OERs so important? Well, for the student, this means free access to some of the world's best courses and even degree programs. Those students who are paying very high costs for basic textbooks will recognize that OERs are a huge cost saving. 
For teachers and ministries of education and governments, they have an opportunity to freely and legally access some of the world's best courses and translate them into local languages, customize them to local examples, as well as innovate on them and reshare their innovations with the rest of the world. Some of the world's best examples of OERs include those from the MIT OpenCourseWare in the United States. MIT OpenCourseWare was different because it explained things step by step. Using the OpenCourseWare saves us a lot of time and money. Another good example is how the government of Brazil is trying to introduce legislation at the national level that would mandate that all educational materials produced with public funds should be openly licensed. I believe that the ones that receive all this amount of public money have an obligation with the society, share the outcomes of their research and its development with the society, who had financed them, allowing the free use of such educational resources. In 2002, UNESCO organized a global forum on the impact of open courseware on higher education. It was at this forum that the term Open Educational Resources, or OERs, was created. On the 10th anniversary of that forum, UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning, with the support of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation USA, are organizing the 2012 World OER Congress. This Congress has three objectives. Release the Paris 2012 Declaration, showcase some of the world's best OER policies, initiatives and experts, as well as celebrate the 10th anniversary of that 2002 forum. The Paris Declaration is very important. It's a non-binding declaration that calls on governments to openly license educational materials produced with public funds. If you can't make it to Paris, you can still follow the Congress through live web streaming. You can send tweets to Identica or Twitter using the tag hash OER Congress. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Well, um, the conference happened um, way back, and, sorry, and, and we participated in it. I want to stop this now. Right. So, open education resources are teaching and learning all research resources that, that have an, an open license or that are in the public domain. And, and here at SAIDI, we, we strongly believe that the, the, the resources that have the type of license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. And, and, and that's where we have some bit of challenges with uh, some of the Creative Commons licenses. Well, whilst they tell us that the resource is open, some of them have restrictions that prohibit people from repurposing those, those resources. And in education, I think it is very important that you give people an opportunity to adapt a resource to suit their particular group of students or their particular context. Because contexts vary, and even student profiles, student types, student needs also vary. So often when an academic is developing a course or even a lesson, they, they think of their students, they think of the needs of their students and what is to be achieved. They bring in the most appropriate resources that will enable the achievement of uh, the learning outcomes. And so repurposing of resources is key. I think it's not good practice in the open access community to develop a resource and then you give it to people to use freely, but, but uh, you, you, you constrain them in terms of how they should use that resource. So you will find that um, the emphasis in this definition is actually our own emphasis say the emphasis, because we strongly believe that all ER should be free. They should, not, they should not require permission to use. They should allow new users to adapt and find new ways to use those resources. 
you won't find um, um, a good definition from the ULET Foundation on that link. Um, I sent the slides already, and I'm assuming that the organizers of this webinar will share the, the slides more widely. So yes, it's, it's a whole range of um, things that are included under OER. They can be full courses, they can be course materials, they can be modules or textbooks or video clips, or even your lecture notes or PowerPoint slides. So OER actually consists of a whole range of uh, teaching resources. And the, the most common type of um, releasing, uh, a license that releases these resources for use by others are the so-called Creative Commons licenses. And we need to be familiar with them. It's actually one of the things that we found to be highly problematic in most of our sub-Saharan African universities, that a lot of people, academics and students alike, sometimes think anything that they can search and find on internet is openly licensed, which is not correct. And they will tell you that, no, I, I actually said they found it on the internet, it was free. So I integrated it in my course. They don't bother to check the type of license under which a particular resource is published in order to be informed on how they should use that resource. It is also worse with our students. And in some instances, you find a fully um, copyrighted book, which is not openly licensed, being photocopied 10, 15 times for students. I mean, one can see the need, one can see why people do that, but it's not legal. It's not legal to do it. And it becomes practice for many years and for many courts of students in an institution. It, it becomes something that is like normal. People can actually be brought to book because of um, uh, the, 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 the contraventions of um, um, these license types and, and, and how they allow usage of various resources. So the types of licenses are, are very important and people should, uh, I think, bother to check what license a resource is published under and therefore decide on how best to use it. And we should also teach our students to do the same, right? Um, give them that kind of literacy so that when they look for resources online, they also may be bothered to check the type of license on the resource and decide on how best to use uh, the resource. So the, best, the most open, which, which we really like at SID, is the CC BY, where one can do anything they want with their resource. All they have to do is to acknowledge the original creator. Uh, and this one, yeah, it, it does allow you to use the resource in any way you like, but you must acknowledge the original creator. But if you adapt and come up with a derivative, with another version of uh, that resource, you should also share that derivative using the same type of license. Right? And this one, yes, it, uh, it does allow you to uh, use the resource in, in any way you like. You must acknowledge the original creator, but it says do not use the resource for purposes of making money. In other words, for purposes of making profit. Don't use it for commercial purposes. Right? That is making money or making profits. It is debatable uh, what, what sort of uh, practices um, constitute a profit making. And, and people can discuss within the context. For instance, if I happen to get a, an openly licensed resource and I like it for my course, I, 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 I say tweak it, I have to replicate it maybe uh, for my students. And then I avail it to my students who are scattered all over the country. I'm allowed to recoup the costs of uh, improving on that resource. If the transportation to my students entailed some costs, if they were not electronic resources, I'm entitled as a university to recoup the transportation costs incurred. And so it, one needs to be uh, quite analytical in terms of what it means to use a resource for profit-making purposes. This one is 
more restrictive than these first three. It says, okay, use the resource in any way you like. Do not use it for making money or making profit. In other words, not for commercial use, but also any derivatives you make out of the resource, make sure that you share using the same type of license. Again, um, sometimes we see a lot of anomalies here, especially in learning materials. You, you, you find people making use of two, three different types of OER to come up with what they want, right? And, and one of those three actually has a share alike license. What it means then is that derivative will have to be shared back using a share alike license and and often um you find in universities people will tell you that no 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 actually we as a university do not want to share this resource which we developed with other institutions or other people but then the argument is you used a a, a resource one of the resources that did this type of license share alike type of license so you are compelled to share back using the same type of license, right? And, and, and this one is even worse, I think, in terms of uh, restricting people. Um, yes, you can use the resource in any way you like. You only need to acknowledge the original creator, but you shouldn't change it. Use it as it is. Don't, don't make any derivatives, no derivatives. There are, there, are, there are occasions when it makes sense to put such a restriction. It depends on the type of resource. But I think by and large, if you do that, you limit the, 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 the extent to which people can use that resource. So if, for instance, the, the examples that are given in the resource are, are, not, are not really relevant examples for your context, you want to change them, right? And sometimes it can even be language. You might want to translate the resource into a different language. And if there is this kind of um, um, uh, license, then it means you cannot be able to do that. Much as the resource may look very valuable and useful for your purpose, you cannot be able to adapt it. And this one is the most restrictive. You don't make any profit out of it. And please don't uh, alter the resource, use it as it is. So generally, uh, you will find that these Creative Commons licenses lie on this continuum, where on the extreme right, you, you have the most restrictive ones. And we, re we really don't believe that resources will be published under these licenses uh, are open. They are, they, are, they are quite closed. But on the extreme left, we have the most, the least restrictive type of licenses. And this is where we would prefer to have all our educational resources so that as many people as possible can access them and they can do whatever they want with them. So why, why advocate for open education resources? Like what was mentioned before, we, we see that a lot of students are doing without enough uh, learning resources. And also shortage of um, academic are limiting the research on the continent. And, and if we have, um, open education resources available in, um, in easily accessible uh, databases. I think it can make a difference in terms of what our students and what our academics can achieve. Okay. The, we, we noticed that uh, there are a lot of uh, pockets of excellence in a number of our universities in the region. But then including um, excellence in the production of good courses, in the production of good learning materials like video clips, but not many people know about those uh, pockets of excellence. Not many people know about the resources that are produced in those places. And therefore they are not maximally made use of because they are not necessarily um, produced as open education resources. So one of the main advantages, I think, of getting your resources uh, widely used, of getting yourself as an individual 
or as a department or as an institution known is to make your good quality resources available to as many people as possible. We, 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 we noticed that uh, there are also changing expectations amongst a lot of our students today who are our main uh, um, clients. They, in, during my days, when I went to university, I was patient enough to sit in front of a professor for two, three, four hours. He would be lecturing and I would be busy taking down notes. Not the type of student we have today. They don't have that patience. If you try to do that, to have a two hour lecture, you, 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 you will find that they will start playing around with their cell phones. Actually, some of them will be Googling what you will be telling them. So they, they are the type of students who want to engage with resources, with methods, and discover things on their own. All we have to do then is to be able to structure those kinds of activities through, say, some kind of tasks which they have to do. You provide them with the resources, as many resources as possible, and they can find the information on their own. And then they can answer um, assignment questions or even sit for an examination. So they tend to have a certain way of learning which they prefer. And providing them with the relevant resources, I think will go a long way in exciting them in the learning process, right? I'll skip all those. I won't, I won't go through them bullet after bullet. And, and so a lot of people in our African universities tell us that there are many challenges they face in so far as the embracing of OER is concerned. Of course they are, but um, we also notice that there are a lot of enablers. There's great potential on the continent for people to use open education resources. In many institutions today, um, we see that there is increased um, attention that is placed on teaching and learning processes. Actually, uh, academics now in some institutions are rewarded for good teaching. In the past, I think people used to look only at publications, at research, but now there is the teaching component that is rewarded for. And so that kind of development, I think augurs very well for embracing open education resources so that in the teaching process, one can be able to bring in as many of those rich resources as possible, right? Whilst there are still a lot of challenges in terms of uh, bandwidth in many institutions, I think generally uh, this has improved over years quite substantially. And we also see a lot of improvements in terms of uh, access to technology, um, the hardware in particular, the smartphones, uh, the tablets and the laptops, and of course the desktops. I think more people now have access uh, to those gadgets than was the case before. And I think that does augur well for embracing open education resources. And we, we, we have a lot of uh, organizations today, including funders that are prepared to fund institutions in the embracing of OER, in the establishment of uh, databases where a lot of open education resources for different disciplines can be, can, can be deposited and people can access freely. We also have uh, a lot of kind of champions now on using open education resources in some of our universities uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, that experience, I think it, it, it's capital that we must exploit. It's an opportunity, I think, that we need to, to exploit so that we enrich our, our resource bases. Yes, like I said, there are also a lot of barriers. And one of the major barriers actually is the, the reluctance 
by many people to change traditional ways of teaching. People, people are, they are very resistant. People are still tempted to want to prepare lectures and go and lecture to students, right? In fact, I think one of the positive aspects the COVID-19 brought about was this emergency remote teaching. It forced everyone, staff and students alike, to use technology, even if they didn't want to associate themselves with technology. People were forced to resort, to resort to using technology and to using different ways of um, teaching and learning. And so I think we, 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 we have to reform in terms of how we think learning takes place and how we think we should support that learning to take place. Our teaching approaches have to change. And if we are prepared to go through such changes, I think we will be able to appreciate the value of uh, OER. A lot of uh, concerns have been raised about the quality of these resources that are free, that one doesn't have to pay for. Can they really be comparable to a prescribed textbook that we get from a bookshop? Yes, I, I strongly um, agree that um, some of, the, not, not all OER, is, is good quality or ER, but the good thing about them is that there is an opportunity for you to make improvements. You identify the weaknesses, weaknesses that are there and you can make improvements. Or you can even find another resource that makes up for the weaknesses you identify in, in resource A. It is better for your students to have such resources than for them to do without anything at all, right? Staff also complain of work overload. They, they, they are ever busy with a whole lot of uh, responsibilities and they don't have the time to actually look for OER. And finding them is one of the challenges that academics talk about. I can't find relevant OER for my discipline. Yes, I do agree. There are some disciplines where it is very difficult for one to find OER that is relevant. But uh, there are also other disciplines where there is a lot of material that is lying out there, which is openly licensed, which can draw upon to enrich um, our courses. Um, it, is, it is important, I think, to appreciate the fact that we, we need to, as we do with our courses, and as we do with any of our university uh, activities anyway, we need to subject uh, the OER that we integrate in our courses to some form of quality assurance. You can do it as an individual using some kind of checklist, and there are so many of them out there that you can use. And you use that checklist and you can be able to identify some of the shortcomings in the OER and you make improvements. Or you can give the resource to a colleague within your department or if it's in a, an electronic resource, as is usually the case, you can send it to somebody who is in any part of the world and they can give you feedback on it and you can make improvements, right? And then some people also talk about low levels of familiarization with OER in their institutions. They will tell you, yeah, 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 man, this is a very good idea, but people here are not familiar with the concept of OER. So I think, we need to do a lot of advocacy in some of our institutions. And in some institutions, there's also lack of support from librarians. I'm glad to hear that uh, at UWC, the library is very active in terms of uh, mobilizing these resources and availing them to students and, and, and staff. I talked about that resistance to change. So the OER Africa has done, like I've said before, a lot of work with in different countries, working with different universities, and they've produced a lot of resources. At the University of Malawi, for instance, as far back as 2008, 2009, we worked with um, the, the Health Sciences Department and produced fabulous materials, learning materials on, on midwifery. It was 
the way actually resources that they wanted to use for their certificate in midwifery. And you can find some of these resources on the OER Africa website. Um, right, my slides are stuck again. Okay. We also worked with the um, um, University of Cape Town and um, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana to produce health OER. And, and a lot of research was conducted on the basis of which extremely valuable resources were produced, which are openly licensed. And, and, and one of the resources that were produced has to do with this awkward disease, which is common in West Africa. It is called the Buruli ulcer disease. And it affects um, people who are largely between age 15, 20 years of age, according to the research. And a, a very good, very good um, handbook was produced based on the research that was conducted about this disease. It's not a common disease, right? It's, it's a, a skin disease which is common only in certain parts of the world like West Africa. And it is currently considered to be one of the neglected trop tropical diseases, less common than uh, tuberculosis, but more common than leprosy. And the resource that was produced actually shows the stages through which this disease develops and how it can be managed. If not well managed, it can lead to body deformities, especially deformities of limbs. Um, this, this, when I, I clicked on this link, let me just show you. I realized that some of the things in there are no longer uh, accessible. Again, this is on, OER, on the OER Africa website. If you go in there, you click there, you will find it will give you very valuable information about, about that disease. Learn about the Buruli ulcer disease, click there. And the idea was it would give you um, information about that disease using different types of media like video clips. It would have text information, it would have diagrams, it would have, it would have a lot of animations. You click there and it takes you to the relevant information. This, this doesn't seem to be, to be, to be uh, working anymore. I'll have to check what, what has happened. So these squares you see here would actually show how the disease progresses from just a simple little ulcer that you can neglect on your skin to quite something that is very substantial, which may actually result in the amputation of your limb. So yes, we produced this kind of resource and it is openly licensed. It was through um, a project that was uh, supported by the ULET Foundation in the United States. Let me see if I can go back to my page. Next slide. Hello. Yeah, Frank, can you hear me? Sorry, sorry. I'm yes, sorry. I, I just want to check if you if you'll be able to to conclude. I think we're we're running out of time. We also need to have okay. some some discussion at the end. Can we maybe try and and wrap it up, please? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Let me do that now. So yes, we produce the resources in agriculture, um, working with uh, schools of vet science in several regional universities. We currently have a big project called OER Africa, sorry, the African Storybook. And there is that website, which has so many stories on it. I won't go into that, um, into that uh, website. You can go in and you can see the thousands of resources that are there, which are mostly used for developing early, early reading literacy. And it is relevant for teacher training programs in universities. Let me end by showing you some of the continuous professional development uh, tutorials, which we call learning pathways that we have. And there are six of them, and you can access them on that, on that website. All of them are OER. Thank you very much. I think uh, that uh, brings me to the end of uh, my talk.
I will stop sharing. Thank you, uh, FM. We'll hand over to Alison. Thanks. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me, everyone? We can hear you. Excellent. So, first of all, I want to thank both Anwar and Ephraim for giving us a very rich introduction and overview of OERs during this Open Access Week. In fact, you've stolen most of my questions. Um, I thought I was going to be very critical and uh, quite provocative, but Ephraim has already touched on some of those. Uh, can I just give a, well, no, let me rather jump in to ask other people if they have some questions. I'll be a little bit more polite. Please, everyone, you are welcome to type a message or else I believe you can unmute yourself if you would like to submit an oral question to either Anwar or to Ephraim. Maybe while people are um, considering their options, I want to just highlight the fact that from my perspective, it often seems that the library is trying to um, advocate for academic staff to do something that's not always easy or comfortable for them to do. And so we, we pull them in a particular direction, but there are, I think at this particular time, um, many contextual factors that would also be considered as push factors, things, conditions that lead them more into the arms of OERs than um, previously. Um, can we just reprise those again? Because I think these are worth thinking about. Either of you, we've had the economic conditions. Yes, we've got covered that one well, Anwar. And you've mentioned some of them, Ephraim, but let's just think about exact context. What is What could be making this an ideal time to resuscitate the push towards OERs? You want me to respond to that? I, um, one of the, I think one of the things that would be compelling for us to use OER is that most of the OER produced are in, 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 in digital form. And we have our students learning away from campuses. It is, it is, it is easier for us as institutions to share digital resources with our students who are learning away from campus than to share with them hard copy materials. So that's, that's one main advantage I see. But secondly, um, because of limited interpersonal interactions in the learning process, I think our students need to be supported by more resources. One resource like one book might not suffice. One student might not find the book appealing enough and might not understand the stuff in that book. But if they were to refer to a different resource, they might find that resource easier to understand and more appealing. So I think the need for us to provide our students with a variety of resources in the learning process makes it compelling that we make more use of OER now. Thanks. And what do you want to add anything? Uh, there's not much to add. I think Ephraim has covered it well. Um, but I, I know from a, from a teaching perspective, it might be difficult to, to control, um, especially when you have to check uh, for plagiarism and so on, when you, when you have uh, a, a wide variety of, of resources that uh, people could cite or, or could use. Um, but, um, you know, having, it, having um, OERs available and, and, and then um, guiding students in, into, you know, using the ones that you've identified, I think, um, but I think there's exactly the problem. Um, as you alluded to, Alison, you know, we, we can um, identify, we can um, promote, but the uptake and the use of this is still very much in the hands of uh, academics. And, um, you know, it's, it's almost a case of uh, don't tell us, we will identify. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I, I what mean, I'm we, saying, yeah. I want to just 
uh, I did make some notes. I'm thinking that they could possibly be more receptive. And I'm thinking specifically at UWC, we've just had the framework for curriculum transformation and renewal. And there are some principles in that which um, emphasize the need to continually be improving and addressing and also to localize materials as far as possible. So we're aware, obviously, of decolonizing the curriculum, um, preparing educational materials that are locally relevant. Um, also, the idea that I, Ifran mentioned of critical pedagogies. We're no longer in the domain where the, the lecturer is standing on top there and, and the rest of us are just recipients of knowledge. The shifting pedagogies now and critical pedagogies reframe that kind of uh, power dynamic in the classroom. And there really is opportunity now for lecturers to be making use of OERs as a pedagogy in themselves to, to center student production of knowledge that can be used as peer learning resources and shared publicly as OERs. Obviously that's quite a, a, a big push, but another factor is the fact that we are now much more multimodally oriented. A lot of us have more digital literacies. Um, and I think also a high premium is put on collaboration. But let me move now to um, an, another question. I want to ask Ephraim and Anwar, um, would you give us a sense of the other role players on campus who could also have a stake in lobbying or developing an OER program, like an infrastructural support program? And what might those contributions be? We can't be the only voice crying in the wilderness. No, we can't. Ephraim has uh, just posted a message. He's just uh, stepped out for two minutes. Um, you're right. I mean, that's, uh, we've had examples of, um, of programs or instances where the library has, has pushed, the library has been trying to lead. And as you say, I mean, the, um, the uptake of this resides elsewhere. So I think teaching and learning specialists uh, have to play a role. Um, I think executive as well um, have to play a role. So it's you know it's about it's about changing the 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 dynamic at play and it's it's the same it's a pro the the process of uh, of of open access. I mean, why do people publish in the the journals that they publish? Why do academics publish in in, in those preferred journals? Um, it's a, the same kind of uh, principle at play with who we are. So, um, uh, as I say, those those are the role players that I would that I would include. Um, in, in addition to to the library, I mean, the library has a, has a, a massive role to play in, in possibly identifying. But um, I think uh, if I'm touched on something that uh, I think largely is overlooked by by possibly academics and uh, um, um, I, I, you've touched on it in, 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 in suggesting when we need to build the DWC, and that is the production of, of OERs. I mean, you know, collating information and, and, and actually producing something that, that can be um, freely available um, is, uh, I think, large level of as well. Yeah, I, I would also think that um, sort of the instructional designers of CIECT would also um, play a role. The, the teaching and learning directorate certainly would need to have a kind of a quality or peer review process. Um, but I mm. do think the library has a role, for example, as you mentioned, in sourcing and um, in providing more insight into the copyright realm because it is a bit intimidating perhaps. Uh, I'm glad you're back, Ephraim. I've got one more question. Um, my, my eyes always light up when I hear the word money, and you mentioned um, that funding and foundations are, are keen to support um, proposals. I noticed that the William and Flora Hewitt um, yeah. has, has been active in that area. But I just want to ask, have grants ever been given to support, like do libraries apply for grants to support piloting of creation of OERs through um, through material design costs or perhaps for 
using postgrad, trusted postgrad students to source and find and adapt approved materials. Have you seen cases like that? They, 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 yeah, they do, they do um, support those kinds of initiatives within a bigger project that, for instance, will involve including like X number of learners from disadvantaged backgrounds, mm. right? And they consider it as a key aspect of uh, development within a developing context. So if, for instance, you argue, we, we will use the available resources to support the so many students, X number of students who will access our courses at, a, at lower fees levels, affordable fees levels for them. And therefore, more of them will come to our institution. In the process then, you ask for funds to develop those kinds of materials. They will usually be keen to support those kinds of projects. It, it is, they are, not, they are not keen to support like the development of materials or courses just for their own sake, for the ordinary type of student who is already able to access university education. They don't consider it to be an important development aspect. Usually it has to do with the disadvantaged, uh, learners from disadvantaged backgrounds or it has to do with um, the disadvantaged gender group, right? Okay. You will have more females participating in this kind of program, and they will use these resources that will have developed. Perhaps they, capacity they, they will... building, capacity building, so maybe? Yes, yes, they do support. In some of our projects, it is largely capacity building in working with OER, in African universities in order to provide what is lacking, which is useful resources that can be used by poor students who can't afford expensive textbooks. Sure. I see that there's yeah. a question that uh, um, is addressed to Anwar. Perhaps we can end with that question. Thanks so well, much. I, as I say, thank you for the question, Lisa. And I wish I could uh, um, say a resounding yes, but. Uh, that would speak to the, the uptake of, of OERs and sadly that's uh, uh, been lacking. There is no significant, uh, significant decrease in, um, in, in your in budgets. Um, and I think, as I said, that's largely to uh, a lack of uptake. It's not um, this substituting the need for, uh, for um, resources um, yet. And I hope that answers your question. But I would like to add one final word uh, on what, you know, your presentation speaks of largely about the library as a, as a connector, as a purchaser and importer of um, knowledge. And we have previously tried to divert library funding towards open access initiatives. Maybe a very radical idea could be that we start to sponsor departments who, who would like where there's a specific need, say for example, psychology, a psychology textbook, and then we work, develop a, a, a collaborative pilot project with that team. Anyway. Okay. Um, Ken. Yes. So um, can, I, can I step in then for a vote of thanks? Um, well, I'll, I'll, as Shaleen, I was going to just, uh, I don't want to, uh, um, you know, get into a debate with, with Alison. It's uh, uh, the, you know, the, I think, I think um, the initiatives from my perspective, uh, we're speaking from, I was speaking from an individual um, institution's perspective. And, uh, and the, the, a large number of the initiatives uh, are driven on a national level. Because the support for for open access, for example, um, is going to uh, you know you're going to be um, I don't know you you your so your single voice is going to be lost in the in the wilderness, so to speak. So it has to be con it has, it has to be a a concerted, coherent effort. It has to be a coordinated effort um, on a on a national level. And I think there are some of those. Um, 
um, um, initiatives afoot. Um, some of the, uh, the transformative agreements that I then mentioned in my presentation, for example, happen at the national level. And those are designed to, to increasingly include um, open access and, and, and um, anything supporting open access into negotiations for, for resources. So yes, I'm, uh, um, the perspective of my presentation was slightly um, um, restricted in, in that I was trying to give an insight into um, our, um, our needs, our, our um, perspective. Okay, colleagues, um, thank you very much. Um, I want to um, really acknowledge um, the presenters today especially Dr. Ifram Mishlanga for your uh, thought provoking presentation and mm -hmm. um, just the new concepts around how we as librarians and um, working in universities embrace um, open access, open educational resources. One of the um, most critical things happening right now, and these are, amidst the pandemic is also a time for revolution and change and rethinking. Uh, for me, it is about uh, the knowledge uh, production, the knowledge creation and how libraries can become more relevant um, in, in, in changing towards a social justice and equitable access for knowledge uh, creation and knowledge generation. But with, with that, uh, having said, I also acknowledge that um, we have um, huge challenges in terms of open educational resources uh, to overcome. But perhaps we do need to uh, engage the, the wider academic community and together we can overcome this for the um, promotion of open access throughout the global community. I, I want to... Um, acknowledge and uh, have a sincere appreciation for um, the UWC research support and scholarly communication team uh, for the uh, deputy directors, um, Mr. Adrianza and Mrs. Alison Pullard, whose um, input into these uh, open access conversations uh, together with the staff of the library into the university and beyond have um, now made for a more enabling um, environment. So um, thank you, um, Dr. Mishlanga, for your uh, presentation this morning. Um, it is um, acknowledged and I sincerely appreciate that you have taken the time to be with UWC today uh, to <laughs> share with us um, your wisdom. And we certainly would like to engage further and um, from, uh, we wish Seda all the best um, in, in the drive towards uh, open access. And I would like to acknowledge and thank every single person, the 30 participants that have been here today. Thank you for your time, for being interested in the new directions that we as a university and as libraries have to undertake. Thank you very much. I wish everyone well and take care further. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.